So before I introduce Ramesh, uh, the, I wanted to thank the uh, people behind the scenes, uh, Shelly Felcom and Catherine Goodwin, who have been arranging everything. Without them, this whole thing falls apart. Anyway, so to, I'm delighted to introduce Ramesh Johari, who's a speaker today. Ramesh is a professor at Stanford University with a full-time appointment in the Department of Management Science and Engineering and courtesy appointments in computer science, electrical engineering. He's a member of the Operations Research Group and the Social Algorithms Lab in MSc and the Information Systems Lab in the an Institute for Computational and Mathematical Engineering. He's also an Associate Director of the Stanford Data Science he received his uh, AB in mathematics from uh, Harvard, a certificate of advanced study in mathematics from Cambridge, and a PhD in electrical engineering and computer science from MIT. He served as a co chair of the ACM uh, Economics and Computation EC program committee in 2019, and he's an area co editor of revenue management and market analytics area for operations research and associate editor for management science in the stochastic models and simulation area and stochastic systems. His interests are quite broad. They're in, they in online platforms, marketplace design, experimentation, and data science for online platforms, and more recently, applications of these techniques to personalize healthcare uh, telemedicine. So, uh, with this, I give the floor to Ramesh. Go ahead, Ramesh. Thanks. All right, thanks. And actually, I think I, I forgot to update my bio. I, um, I'm a uh... A, uh, um, I was an area co-editor at, at OR until the end of uh, 2020, and then that was the end of my term, so I stepped down at that point. Um, so, he, but, so he's no longer the area editor. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. No, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm clear. Um, okay, good. So uh, um, I'll be talking about this work today that's joint with um, with uh, Peter Glynn, Jose Blanchett, Mohamed Rasuli, Lin Jia Wu. The, the bulk of the talk will be devoted to a NeurIPS paper with Peter and Mohammed, um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the ongoing work that we have. Um, and, uh, and then also I'll um, kind of talk a little bit about how this fits into a broader interest in experimental design uh, and, and problems I've been working on otherwise. So, oh, let me see. Hmm. This is strange. Oh, let's see. Um, It's very interesting. Okay, so it is not. It doesn't seem to be moving. Yeah. yeah, I don't know why it doesn't want to move. So let's try this again. Actually, I'm going to just reopen the slide. Sorry. I think preview, oh, no, is, preview is not cooperating. Sorry, let's bring this to work again. Right. Oh, it still doesn't want me to do that. Okay, <laughs> I don't know why it's so uncooperative. All right, let me try a different approach here. Let's try this. This worked uh, literally like, and we'll try this. This is less elegant, but maybe this will work. Okay, can you see that okay? Yeah. Okay. No, it still doesn't work. Oh, there we go. All right, now it's working. Okay, so that's fine. It'll flash page numbers at the bottom, but that's okay. Um, so, uh, so the motivation for the work is that um, suppose that you're, you know, one of these online platforms and you have two algorithms that you want to compare. And I think a good, uh, mental model to have in mind is something like, you know, if you're Lyft or Uber, uh, you have matching algorithms that match riders and drivers, um, and you want to compare two different matching algorithms. So one of the challenges in A-B testing or experimenting on these kinds of algorithms is that, you know, typically the way we think about experiments is that you would randomize, you know, let's say drivers to treatment and control, and then you would see, um, you know, what is the, what is the relative improvement uh, um, in the new algorithm versus the old algorithm. But one of the problems with randomizing drivers or randomizing riders is that it's a matching algorithm. So it actually involves interconnections between drivers and riders uh, throughout the entire network. So you can't really very easily, you know, randomize at the individual unit level of a driver or a rider. Um, really what's happening here is these are algorithms that change the state of the entire system. 
And so at a high level, a, a challenge that these, con, uh, these kinds of platforms deal with regularly is, uh, you know, how do we design an experiment um, to compare these two algorithms? And how do we develop an estimator on top of that experiment to compare the, the two algorithms? Uh, now, I want to say that, like, at that level of generality, this is actually a problem that arises in many contexts. Uh, you know, I might have two multi arm banded algorithms, two recommendation algorithms, two search algorithms. Um, I might have two treatment planning approaches for, for patients in a clinical context, or uh, two ways to develop curriculum in an educational context. And I want to be able to compare these policies or these algorithms. Uh, and these algorithms actually if they interact with the entire state of the system to decide what they will do, I can't really randomize individual elements uh, of the system. I have to randomize kind of, I have to take the entire system and subject it to either A or B, okay? So that's kind of the key uh, departure point for our question. And, um, you know, thinking about it naively, like one way you could do it is that you could, um, you know, randomize uh, over time. So suppose your goal, is to estimate the steady state difference in reward between the two algorithms. So you might have these two matching algorithms and you wanna know, you know, what's the difference in the number of completed rides, for example, under algorithm B versus algorithm A. Um, these kinds of uh, issues also have been documented in uh, food delivery platforms. And in that case, maybe you would care about um, like the difference in delivery delay between algorithm B and algorithm A or something like that. So um, suppose you're interested in some estimate of reward, uh, a, a treatment effect difference between these two algorithms. Oh, and by the way, maybe I should just say here, uh, one of the questions that often comes up, and, and of course, anyone should interrupt me whenever you want. Uh, one of the questions that comes up is, well, um, you know, I'm interested in estimating the difference in steady state reward. Like, why is that? If all I really care about is picking the best algorithm, then why bother estimating the steady state difference in reward? And I think that's a longer conversation kind of outside this talk, but at, you know, in, a, in a short answer, I would say um, one of the reasons that platforms run experiments rather than you know, just use like an adaptive uh, bandit type or reinforcement learning type of algorithm is that um, there's actually interest in validating the, the choice to do one versus the other. And there's also interest in understanding the choice, like why was one better than the other? And so that kind of inference viewpoint is a really important piece of experimentation and A-B testing. And that partly comes from the fact that these are algorithms that are deployed within decentralized organizations where, uh, where there's an emphasis on um, uh, kind of being able to talk about your findings you know, beyond just the group that ran the experiment. So you know, happy to talk more about that, but I think that's an important point to know that there's this, uh, there's this kind of organizational reason why experiments are run to estimate this difference in rewards rather than just to adaptively find the best outcome. Okay, so now, um, you know, one way that you could, you could solve this problem is you could just at each decision epoch, randomly flip a coin and run, you know, either algorithm A or algorithm B um, on that decision epoch. So in the ride sharing example, every time a rider shows up and you have to match them, you could flip a coin and decide, well, I use algorithm A to match this writer or use algorithm B to match this writer, okay? So the problem with this is what's called the carryover effect um, or what we refer to as temporal interference, um, which is basically that, you know, if I use algorithm A to match a writer, that'll change the state of the algorithm the next time that I choose to run algorithm B. And, you know, so what's happening here is that like, you know, think about, Suppose algorithm A is more conservative. It's, it's more uh, conservative in, in driver supply. So it tries to hold back driver supply, tries to preserve driver supply uh, for future use. And algorithm B is much more aggressive in using up driver supply. Um, so for example, that might mean that algorithm A, when you show up, um, tries to preserve su supply nearby. Maybe it will try to match you to someone further away, longer ETA. Um, algorithm B, if it's more aggressive, will try really hard to match you to someone close by, no matter you know, if the number of cars close by is dwindling. And so if you think about what will happen in this case, every time you run algorithm B, it's going to aggressively try to take cars off the market and you know, that are nearby and match them up with, with the rider. Well, when algorithm A is then asked to do a matching, it will artificially see a depressed level of supply that's been left behind to it by algorithm B. So what this is, what's happening here is that at, at, at one decision epoch, at one rider, the, um, the outcome in terms of the matching is something which is affected by the decisions that were taken before that time point, okay? 
So this is, you know, if you think of the time steps as being experimental units, this is what would be called interference in a in a experimental design context. Um, and typically in causal inference, if you have interference between units, so interference essentially means the treatment condition of one unit can influence the outcome that you see on another unit. Um, if you have that type of interference, that'll typically introduce bias using naive estimation techniques. Okay, so this is something that's been well known and well understood. Um, here's an example in industry practice uh, where you know they may have time divided into non-overlapping intervals, and uh, typically these are fixed length. In the first interval, they'll run algorithm A. In the second interval, they'll run algorithm B. Um, just to confirm, PJ, can you see my mouse pointer? Yes, I can, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, so they'll run algorithm A, then algorithm B, then algorithm A, then algorithm B, and so on uh, in different time units over some you know, win experimental window. So this will eventually terminate at some point. Um, and you know, why do they do this? So this period of time when A is running, the idea is that you're not randomizing an individual instance you randomize only over longer blocks of time, okay? And each of these successive intervals, you uh, you run either algorithm A or algorithm B. You compute a you know a sample average estimate of your reward earned in this period for algorithm A, this period for algorithm B, and so on. Average that up over all the periods where you ran A and where you ran B, and use the difference as an estimate of your your treatment effect, okay? Um, now, the problem is that this doesn't actually eliminate temporal interference or that carryover effect, because you could see that at these boundaries, I'm switching from A to B. So again, if B was that aggressive matching algorithm that uses up drivers quickly, A is always going to be systematically left with less supply available. So now, to deal with that, maybe what you do is you lengthen the length of these intervals so that that carryover effect, the temporal interference, is weakened, Okay, so you don't see as much of that. But then you have a different problem, which is it's not clear whether it's efficient from a sampling efficiency standpoint to separate uh, the intervals up this way. In practice, what's done is this assignment of A and B to fixed intervals is determined ahead of time. It's completely non-adaptive. The intervals are fixed. Um, so it's not a very sophisticated design or estimation procedure. And the hope is that you know by designing these things with long enough intervals, they don't have to worry too much about bias. OK. Um, so this is kind of our, our point of departure. Um, you know, so far I've given you like three slides that are practical motivation. The thing I described here is actually industry standard practice. It's used at, at Lyft, uh, you know, Uber, other ride-sharing platforms, DoorDash. Um, so it's very standard. Um, and this type of design, you know, that, that kind of approach is very, very standard. Uh, what we wanted to do is we wanted to step back and take a kind of fundamental theoretical look at the problem and ask, well, what's really going on here? What's the statistical problem being solved? How can we model that problem? What would be good if experimental designs for that problem? And what are efficient estimation techniques for that problem? So I'll, I'll go into the details of this a bit more. Um, the most important thing on this slide is really this uh, part at the top here, which is that we cast the problem of uh, testing two algorithms as a theoretical problem of comparing two Markov chains. And that really for us was like the kind of, I'd say what makes this work innovative or, or what's like an interesting point of departure. And that is that, um, uh, you know, what we did is we said, well, think of algorithm A as being one Markov chain. Think of algorithm B as being another Markov chain. And now what we wanna do is we wanna compare the difference in reward in these two Markov chains. So now what that allows us to do is to bring to bear a lot of the machinery of Markov chain analysis to think about the underlying statistical problem of design and estimation. Okay. So the talk is really a theory talk. Uh, you know, you'll see that for a variety of different reasons, what I'm going to show you wouldn't be immediately practically implementable, but I'm hoping that it'll illuminate some interesting features of the problem, both mathematically and, you know, otherwise conceptually that, uh, that can be the foundations for how we might think about the problem in practice. And so that's kind of what our roadmap is to, to get through the work that we've done here. Okay. Um, so before I go on, let me just pause any questions on the setup or, or what the class, you know, I haven't told you the model yet, but just in terms of the, the type of problem I'm interested in. I mean, I was going to ask a question. I think you sort of answered it in a way, but um, um, Okay, there is something in the chat, but maybe maybe. Oh, sorry, yeah, I didn't open the chat actually. Let me do that. No, no, that's I usually okay. keep, I usually keep it open. Um, okay, I said that the problem is that A and B will interfere with each other. 
Therefore, why not do something naively that you set the time under long enough or separate the ride, the cars into two groups completely and use two algorithms? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I'll come back to this at the end, actually. So in terms of making the time intervals long enough, you can totally do that, right? And now the question becomes, well, if you do that, what's your analysis strategy for estimating the, the behavior of each algorithm? And is that the efficient way to allocate your samples? Okay, so this is something we'll return to in the work that we do. Um, but that is absolutely a good question. One thing you should know is that, um, oh, let's see, can you guys hear me okay? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Achilles says he can't hear anything. Yeah. Uh, I guess, Bo, you must have been able to hear me since you said, <laughs> you asked me a question about what I'd said. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll keep going and uh, if yeah, there's any issues. To... Okay, yeah, maybe Vijay, you can uh, text Achilles and just uh, help him figure out what's up with the audio but um uh so yeah um on the on the question though you know in, in terms of how these experiments are analyzed in practice the way it's usually done is to actually treat each interval of time as an observation so one basic problem they run into is if they lengthen the intervals they have fewer observations mechanically because they're they're running they have they have more and more observations uh sorry more and more uh uh time units being compressed into one interval um you know, so there that there you get into a bias variance trade off where the bias goes down if you make the intervals longer, but the variance goes up because you mechanically have fewer observations. Now, by thinking of it as a Markov chain analysis problem, you can deal with that variance issue a little bit so that you don't you don't uh, lose variance by by looking at longer intervals. And and, you know, the key question from our perspective then is, well, what's the what's the um, efficient policy to decide at each decision epoch, you know, which of the two uh, uh, algorithms you try to run? You also said you could separate the cars into two completely different clusters, and you could do that. And actually, that's a common thing that's done is to run algorithm A in one city and B in another city. But there are the real issues that your power are limited. Uh, you're limited by how many cities you have. And that might be a very small number of, of universes in which you get estimates. So a lot of these questions come down to how you reduce your variance, how you efficiently use the samples available to you. So it's a good question. I'm going to try to return to that a little bit at the end from the perspective of different designs. Um, OK. So I won't spend as much time on this. Vijay, I'm happy to share the slides with you. Um, there's a number of different pieces of literature that are related, uh, some of them on, on experimental design uh, you know, within clinical trials. These, uh, this is a paper that specifically talks about switchback experiments. Um, it's kind of the first stats paper that gave it that name. Um, it's a cool paper because it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's on agricultural experimentation and specifically uses cows as the motivating example for switchback experiments, where the idea is that cows have some non-stationarity in the amount of milk that they'll make over time. And so that, uh, and, 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 you know, that prompts this kind of switchback structure that I described. Uh, this is a paper that takes a causal inferential view to the approach of uh, designing switchback experiments. Um, you know, lots of work on looking at network interference, marketplace interference and experimentation. Um, and uh, actually, one of the mistakes here is that we have, there's a piece of work that I have with a graduate student and with Gabriel Weintraub and with Hannah Lee, Gabriel Weintraub, Nessa Leskovich that I didn't cite here that I should have. Um, this is also very closely connected to a number of different pieces of the literature on estimation and Markov chains. Um, and that includes, you know, one of the interesting things you'll see later is that we're going to be looking at what am effectively amounts to a Markov decision process with a um, with a uh, minimum variance objective. And those are generally intractable. So one of the cool technical things in our work is that this ends up being a tractable optimization problem, tractable in an appropriate sense, I'll make that clear. Um, it's also related to some work in uh, policy evaluation and reinforcement learning. Again, for reasons that you'll see, one could think of this as an RL problem where your objective is to estimate this treatment effect and the you know, underlying Markov chains that you don't know are these two uh, Markov chains that you're comparing. Um, OK, so let's start with some preliminaries on the model. Uh, it's basically a non-parametric finite state space Markov chain model. So I've discrete time, finite state space S. X and Y will always denote states in my talk. I have two algorithms, and one and two will denote the algorithm with an index L that have unknown irreducible transition matrices. OK, so these transition matrix is indexed by the algorithm, the states uh, from and to. Um, each of these two ir uh, matrices are irreducible, so they have invariant distributions pi, uh, pi 1, pi 2 uh, for the two matrices, uh, and we'll view invariant distributions as row vectors. Okay. 
There's some unknown reward distribution that depends on the chain that I run, the state that I go from, and the state that I go to. And really all that's gonna be important for the talk is going to be this uh, expected reward when I'm in state X and I run chain L. And this is an expectation of that, of that reward uh, given the state I'm in and the, and the chain that I run, okay? And we view this expected reward uh, um, for each chain indexed by state as a column vector over states. All right, so at time n, I have some state xn, some action an, and then that gives me a reward rn. Um, what I'm interested in is measuring the steady state difference in expected reward between the two chains, which is essentially, uh, you know, this pi is a row vector, r is a column vector. So I'm interested in like the steady state reward of chain two minus the steady state reward of chain one. All right, that's the quantity of interest. That's what I'm going to call my, my treatment effect and, and what a causal inference or statistician, a causal inference expert or statistician would call the S demand of interest. Okay. All right. So what do we get to choose? We get to choose an estimator and a design. So what is an estimator? An estimator is essentially an adapted sequence of random variables that are adapted to the history um, that take on real values. So, you know, that's a pretty broad definition. Effectively, the way to think about it is we're going to use the history to compute a value. That value is, is supposed to be our estimate of the treatment effect. And one of my goals will be to tell you, well, how do we compute these estimates in the talk? A design is a policy for which chain I will run at each time step. So this has to be something which is adapted to the history and we're going to allow randomized design. So the design can flip a coin to decide which of the two policies it will run at each time step, okay? Um, now, I haven't said it here on the slide, but I'll just say it in words and then we'll come back to it. There are two things that we're going to hope for from our combination of design and estimator. One of them is consistency, which is essentially the requirement that as n goes to infinity, our estimates converge to the true treatment effect, that alpha n converges to alpha in an appropriate sense as n goes to infinity. The other thing we're going to ask for is sample efficiency which is that if I look at some appropriate notion of variance for the difference between this estimate and the truth, that that variance is, is small. And we, I need to formalize both of these ideas for you. What is consistency? What is a small variance? Okay. So, uh, you know, the first thing, oh, let me ask just any questions on the model definition. It's all fairly straightforward Markov chains so far. I haven't done anything very creative. Um, just two finite state space Markov chains that I want to compare and estimate this, uh, this difference. Uh, for them. And I get to choose which one I run, and I get to choose how I estimate the difference based on what I've seen so far. Okay. Any questions? So just as an example, a simple design could be at each time step, flip a coin to decide which chain you run, and estimate just use the difference of sample averages of rewards that you've seen so far. So that would be biased. It also would not be sample efficient uh, for reasons we'll see later. Okay. Any questions? Good. I don't know. I don't see anything in chat either. Oh, okay. okay. Yep. Good. Comment, this is, thank you. Yeah. Feel free to drop questions in chat as I'm going, or just unmute and interrupt me if you if you have questions. Um, okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, maximum likelihood estimation as a way to try to estimate uh, the the rewards, um, and specifically, it's going to be non-parametric maximum likelihood, which basically all that means is that I directly I, I estimate the primitives of these Markov chains from what I've seen so far, and then use that to compute an, an estimate of the difference in steady state rewards. Specifically, uh, there's a lot of notation on this slide, but I'd focus just on a simple description of what it is. Gamma n will denote the number of times that I play, I've played state, uh, I've played chain L in state X in the first n steps. Rn will be the um, sample average expected, uh, sample average reward that I've earned when I was uh, over all the previous time steps um, when I was in state X and I played chain L, which is essentially the sum of rewards with those properties divided by the number of times that I've played that chain. Um, PN is an empirical transition matrix. How often was I in state X and I went to state Y when I played chain L? Um, now, you notice in the normalization here, I take a max of gamma and one, and that's just to make things simple in a situation where this uh, gamma could be zero, where I haven't played chain L in state X yet. Um, I just wanted to make it concrete that the denominator would be, would be positive. Uh, in the end, those estimates will just be zero in that case. Okay. 
All right. So, um, uh, you know, one of the things that's not too hard to establish is that, um, you know, asymptotically, uh, um, you know, as long as gamma n is going to infinity, uh, then, you know, this will eventually be an irreducible transition matrix. So it's meaningful to talk about the invariant distribution of that, of that empirical transition matrix, okay? So uh, let pi n be the invariant distribution of that, of that transition matrix, then our estimate, our non-parametric maximum likelihood estimate of the reward is just that steady state distribution um, for each estimated steady state distribution for each chain, uh, inner product, the reward, estimated reward vector uh, uh, for each of the two chains, and then the difference of those two things. So this is basically what I'm doing is I'm, I'm computing empirical estimates for the pro transition probabilities and the rewards. I use the empirical estimate for the transition probabilities to compute uh, an estimated invariant distribution. Then I use the estimated invariant distribution to compute the estimated difference of steady state rewards. Okay, does this make sense to everybody? So the reason it's non-parametric maximum likelihood is because I don't put any parametric structure on the transition matrices. Um, you could argue that it's parametric in the sense that the parameters are the entries in the transition matrices, but that's not a kind of interesting sort of parametric model. Um, so so in that, that's kind of why we use the phrase uh, non-parametric maximum likelihood. Hey Ramesh, uh, why this is a, a maximum likelihood estimator? Oh, because this, it, uh, that's, that's a very good question. Like, <laughs> um, so this is a maximum likelihood estimator. You agree with that? Like that's, pretty, yes. that's, a, mm -hmm. that's obvious, right? Right, right. Uh, so then this just uses equivariance of the maximum likelihood estimator. So okay. maximum likelihood has the property that if I if theta hat is the MLE of theta, then f of theta hat is the MLE for f of theta. And so the way to think of it is that the, the mapping that takes an irreducible transition matrix and produces an invariant distribution and then produces steady state rewards, uh, you know, that mapping, right, mm -hmm. is being applied to the maximum likelihood estimators for the steady state reward and transition matrix mm. to get the maximum likelihood estimator for the steady state reward. As for the difference of state state rewards. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. Okay, yep. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's a very good question. Sorry. Um, okay, good. So that's the MLE. And, you know, this is an important point in general. I mean, one of the interesting dimensions of freedom you have here is which estimation strategy do you choose to use? So I'm just using the maximum likelihood estimation strategy here. Okay. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to optimize over what are called time average uh, regular policies. This is a very weak regularity requirement. And all it requires is that the frequency with which I play action X, of uh, which with I play policy L in state X, okay, that frequency should converge to some well-defined limit. That limit can even be random. It can be probabilistic, that's fine, right? So there may be some distribution to that limit, that's okay. But all I require is that these frequencies have some well-defined limits. So essentially what this is ruling out is that I play policy one, then two, then one, then two on exponentially increasing time intervals, because that will not be something that has a well-defined limit, policy limit. But for example, something where I play policy uh, one, some fixed fraction of the time in state X and policy two, some fixed fraction of the time in state X, that would certainly be time average regular, okay? And for our theory, what we'll require is that these gammas are almost surely positive. That's, that's uh, the, the main requirement that we put on them. Okay. All right. So it's a very weak regularity requirement, but an important one. It's, it's something that I think certainly doesn't rule out any, you know, it, 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 I don't think it rules out reasonable or interesting policies from uh, any sort of more uh, interpretable perspective, but it is an important mathematical restriction. Okay. Um, so one thing I didn't I didn't say here I thought I had it in the slide but I must have actually accidentally uh, maybe I, maybe I accidentally commented something out when I compiled it. Um, one of the important things that I hope is immediately apparent is that if a policy is time average regular, then this resulting estimator will be consistent. And really the reason for that is that if a policy is time average regular, I will get infinitely many samples of 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 this. In uh, sorry, this will go to infinity. So this will converge um, to the true value of P, okay, um, in probability and, and uh, in fact, almost surely. Uh, actually, no, sorry, our convergence is only in probability here, uh, in probability. Um, so we'll have convergence in probability to the true, true transition matrix P. These rewards will converge to the true expected rewards. 
And therefore, it's easy to see that the um, estimator will converge to the true difference of steady state rewards, okay? All in, in probability. So essentially what we'll get is, is consistency of our estimator for free as soon as we have a time average regular policy, which was actually one of the reasons we thought of focusing on time average regular policies in the first place is the time average regularity with maximum likelihood estimation is actually taking care of the bias problem. So that's giving us a class of policies and estimators where we know already that we will have consistency in the limit. We'll correctly be estimating the, the, uh, the treatment effect. Okay. Um, so what's interesting to look at for this class of policies is sample efficiency. And for that, what we do is we look at the difference between this uh, MLE estimator and the, the true, uh, um, the true uh, treatment effect scaled by the square root of the number of observations. So this is essentially a, you know, a central limit scaling uh, on the difference between the MLE and the truth. Okay, so you, know, you think about your standard central limit theorem to look at the behavior of let's say a sample mean versus the truth. Uh, you know, this is the shape that a central limit theorem would take. Okay, and we have a weak convergence here to something on the right that's an appropriately defined random variable that I'll explain to you now. So the first thing to know is that this thing on the right is a linear combination of normal random variables, okay, where uh, each of these normal random variables are standard normals. Those are the Gs, all right? Um, now those Gs, those normal random variables, uh, they're all independent, uh, standard normal. So this overall, this kind of summation of all of this stuff is also a normal random variable with some mean and some variance, okay? Um, so, uh, um, you know, what's happening here is that um, since all of these are normal zero one random variables, of course, the mean on the right-hand side is zero. That's, that's essentially consistency. That's, uh, you know, that's something that we're recovering the consistency that I talked about a second ago. So let's talk about the variance. What's the variance of the normal random variable on the right-hand side, okay? So to understand that, I need to tell you what, what pi, sigma, and gamma are. Pi is the invariant distribution of the corresponding Markov chain, either chain two or chain one, okay? And gamma is what I call that policy limit, okay? So gamma, remember, was the fraction of time that I play chain two in state X or the fraction of time that I play state one in chain X. So here what's happening is I get the square root of that fraction in the denominator. All right, which makes sense. If I'm in a state X and I play chain two less, I should have a higher variance estimate of, uh, of, of that chain. And so that's exactly what this is capturing. And in fact, that dependence is square root on inverse square root on the fraction of time I play that chain. So the last piece that's interesting is the sigma. And the sigma here is the variance of the reward that I earn. So that's RJ plus this G tilde term, okay? Now, what is that G tilde? Essentially, what G tilde is capturing is the downstream sort of sequential estimation, uh, a se sequential increase in variance that happens um, uh, when I play uh, chain two uh, in state X, or sequential uh, uh, contribution to estimation variance that arises from playing, two in state, playing chain two in state X or chain one in state X. And you know, this is something which is kind of a classical Markov chain central limit theorem element, which is that this G tilde here um, solves what's called Poisson's equation. And that's this equation. It, maybe you've not seen it before. So Poisson's equation is something which you, know, you, you can actually show. There's a family of solutions to this equation that depend on the matrix that you put in right here. So it's identity minus the transition matrix plus some matrix here. Um, Poisson's equation is the solution to this, uh, uh, this uh, dynamical system with R on the right-hand side. So G tilde is the, is, the, is the solution you get there, or, or said differently, you get I minus P plus pi times G has to equal R, okay? Um, for every matrix you could plug in here, you get a different solution to Poisson's equation. And uh, you know, the one we're choosing is the one that arises uh, when you put in um, when you put in the matrix where every row is uh, is the is the invariant distribution for that chain, okay? And it turns out that that's the correct solution to be able to construct the variance formula here, right? So essentially, what's happening is that we have this new reward function g tilde, okay? And what we're computing here is the variance of the one step reward in a Markov chain where g tilde is my reward. 
So why is it a one-step reward? It's because this dynamic is exactly capturing the long run impact over many stages in chain L uh, of to reward um, uh, of playing chain L. Okay. So this is this is kind of that, you know, this is this is sort of a one-step random variable now uh, defined by this function. Um, and I guess uh, you know, one of the things I want to point out is that there's a long history. Many of you I'm I'm I think may know this, and some of you may not. Uh, there's a long history of the use of Poisson's equation in both discrete and continuous time and in discrete and continuous state spaces to study the behavior of Markov chains. It's a very rich uh, theory and a rich approach. Um, one of the most important reasons it's so powerful is, is, is that it allows us to convert much of the analysis we want to do about the rewards of the Markov chain into a Martingale analysis. Um, and uh, I'll comment briefly on this uh, uh, in a moment. But essentially, the idea is that if you look at um, the behavior of uh, the difference of the chain between its actual behavior and expected behavior uh, for this, uh, you know, uh, for G tilde. So you look at sort of G tilde LXJ minus the expected behavior of G tilde LX, um, you know, that, that behaves like a martingale. And then you can use martingale techniques to study uh, um, the, the central limit theorem that we have here to establish the central limit theorem we have here. Okay. Um, now, technically speaking, kind of the key benefit to us in, in applying uh, Poisson's equation is the following. It really comes from the fact that the, the invariant distribution is the solution to an inverse problem. And Poisson's equation kind of simplifies our approach to dealing with that. So let me explain what I mean. We're interested in this difference, the difference between our estimator and the truth. And that difference is, an, is a difference between this you know, estimated steady state reward and, and true steady state reward. Um, so what we do is we add and subtract a term in here, which is this pi n times r. Okay, we subtract that and we add it. So when we do that, this first term is now just looking, is essentially an average value of the difference between rn and r. And this term can be used, you know, analyzed using standard central, central limit techniques. It's true that we have this pi n that's changing over time, but pi n is converging down to pi. So in terms of a central limit scaling, we can kind of focus most of our attention on the variance that's being contributed from this difference in rewards. And, and that can be done using kind of standard central limit theorem type arguments for, for Markov chain rewards. What's more interesting is the second term where we have a difference in invariant distributions and we wanna be able to analyze that. Now that's a lot harder because if you think about where this is coming from, the difference in invariant distributions comes from the difference in the transition matrices. And small changes to the estimated transition matrix can have big changes in you know, what we see here, potentially. So thinking about how we can use perturbation analysis on the transition matrix to be able to characterize perturbations of this, of this uh, distribution from the truth, that's an important transformation. And that's exactly where Poisson's equation is helpful. It allows us to rewrite this term, which is a difference in the steady state distributions times the steady state uh, times the reward vector. It allows us to rewrite that in terms of something which is a difference in the probability matrices, in the transition matrices. So this directly comes from the definition of Poisson's equation. And by doing that, uh, we're able to translate this perturbation term into this perturbation term where then we can use martingale arguments to analyze uh, this, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the terms that arise um, in, this, in this expression. Uh, so that's kind of a standard sort of martingale CLT uh, type of approach to fill in the rest of the argument here. Okay, so you know, at a high level, one of the things I wanna point out is that this is like a really cool use of Poisson's equation to move from a setting where you need a difference in steady state reward distribution, sorry, steady state distributions. You can use Poisson's equation to move that into a statement about differences in transition matrices. So that's kind of a useful technical trick to keep in mind. Okay. All right, let me just quickly pause there, ask if there's any questions uh, before I run through the kind of the rest of the talk. This is sort of the key technical idea in our, in our central limit theorem here. Any questions or, or comments? No? Okay, uh, one other quick comment I'll make, Vijay, um, uh, I think may already know this, but Peter Glynn gave a talk in uh, what's called the SNAP seminar, which is uh, uh, an applied probability seminar that's been running since last summer, virtually. 
Um, and he gave a talk on three uses of Poisson's equation uh, last fall. So that would be a great talk to look up. Um, I think if you're interested in this technique and kind of its applications, uh, he has a number of different nice applications in there. One of them he mentions is this one uh, from our joint work. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this expression in the central limit theorem to compute a variance optimal policy. Okay. And that's basically going to involve me optimizing over these, uh, these uh, values, these gammas, right? Um, and so to do that, what I do is I define a feasible region, which is, well, what constraints do these time average regular policies have to satisfy? And it's pretty easy to see that, of course, the sum of those uh, fractions of time that I run chain L in state X, this sum has to be one because I can only be in, uh, any given, in one state at any given time and only run one chain at any given time. So this sum has to be one. In addition, <clears throat> I have to have some type of flow conservation. And that's this equation here, all right? And this is basically saying that, you know, this is the fraction of time that I'm in state Y. And that has to obey this flow conservation equation where, you know, in, in state X, I run chain L, this fraction of time, and that's the probability I transition to chain Y. Right? So, so this is a kind of flow conservation, this is just a, a mass, a unit mass. And a key lemma is that the law of any time average regular policy limit, you know, so the law of this gamma is a probability measure over this thing. Now, this is a convex compact region, right? And so what we want to do if we want to minimize variance is we want to minimize the, the square of the variance that, you know, so, so think of this as the standard deviation of that random variable. This is the standard deviation of this random variable. And so if I add the squares of all of these quantities together, that's my objective function. That's my variance, my scaled asymptotic variance. And I want to minimize that subject to being my policy limit being in this set. But now you notice this is a convex optimization problem in the kappas. And so you can realize that optimal solution um, you know, basically by running a policy where you first solve this optimization problem find that kappa star and run the following stationary Markov policy where you play chain L in state X with a probability that's proportional to that solution, okay? Now, there's an, so, so two comments on this. Number one, this is what I meant when I said that we're solving essentially an MDP with a variance minimization objective in a very nice way. So here we get a convex optimization problem that's giving us the variance optimal policy, uh, this kappa star. Uh, optimal choice of one and two. Now, another thing I want to mention, though, is that I can't actually do this because I don't know the primitives, right? This is saying, this is kind of the Oracle optimal policy, where like if I had access to the, the true P, the true reward distribution, I could compute this thing. This would be the optimal way to go about estimating the alpha. But I can't compute this design because I don't know those things. In fact, that's the whole reason I'm running an experiment in the first place. So, uh, you know, so this is sort of a theoretical ideal, not something I can actually do, right? And so one of the contributions of our paper is to figure out a way to turn this into an online algorithm that has the same asymptotic uh, scaled minimum variance, right? Um, so this is a theorem that says that, you know, the design you get here, this design that runs chain L in state X with this probability minimizes the asymptotic variance over all time average regular policies and you can show that by using Jensen's inequality on the objective function. So even if you had a stochastic policy here, that would do worse than something that uh, solved this deterministic uh, variance minimization problem, right? Um, so that's sort of our construction of an optimal policy. Um, I just want to quickly mention, you know, it's a, a way that we construct a policy that's online and optimal, meaning a policy that doesn't know the primitives in advance but then still is able to get the same asymptotic variance is to add what we call forced exploration. So for example, something you could do is at every state X, you can run chain L with a prob probability that looks like what we got on that previous slide, but with an additional forced exploration term that leads you to play chain one or chain two with some forcing probability. What this does is it guarantees you learn enough about the transition matrices and the rewards everywhere uh, to be able to make sure that this kappa converges to the right policy. And then, you know, that ensures that actually you're getting efficient variance in the end. Okay, so you just have to make sure your forced exploration goes down at a correct rate with time. Uh, in the paper, we use square root of n, inverse of square root of n, 
Though, of course, you can have multiple different scalings here and still get uh, the same scale asymptotic variance uh, convergence. Okay. Um, so structurally, one thing I want to mention that's interesting is like one of the things that this, this problem reveals is that uh, you can do a lot better sometimes by cooperatively exploring to learn about the steady state reward difference. So here's a simple example, okay? So in this example, suppose the two chains are, oh, sorry, go ahead. Just a quick thing, how would you solve for the K, Kn's for the... Um, the oh, got it, yeah, yeah, sorry. I didn't say that. Uh, this is just straight empirical solution. Or take the so, empirical P matrix yep. that you can and then solve this, okay, all right. Okay. Yeah, 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 but exactly. I needed the P matrix as well, even that, the optimization, that's perfect. Thanks, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, so the way I solve this is I would just have empirically estimated everything, okay. and then just go ahead and solve the problem with that empirical estimate. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so in this problem, in this example, there's two Markov chains. There's a red chain that just deterministically cycles around counterclockwise, a blue chain that deterministically goes clockwise. The chains earn zero reward in every state they're in. And the only uncertainty here is that you have some policy dependent unknown stochastic reward in state one. All right. So now suppose that you were trying to estimate the performance of chain one using only chain one. What would happen is that every S times or every S time steps, you would get one observation of the reward for chain one. Okay. And every S time steps around the other way, you'd get one observation of the reward for chain uh, two for the blue chain. If you were using only that chain to be able to explore. All right. Now contrast that to what you could do if you had both chains available. Then what I could do is when I'm in state one, maybe I run chain one, that gives me an observation of the reward for chain one and takes me to state two deterministically. And now I switch right away to running the other chain that takes me back to chain one. And I run the other chain another time step. And that means I get now an observation of the blue chain's reward. And now I switch back to the red chain, then the blue chain, then the red chain. This means that every two time steps, I'm getting one observation of reward instead of every S time steps which creates an unbounded gap in the difference in variance in estimation between this adaptive between this policy that's cooperatively using both chains to learn about the other versus a policy that is forced to use only one chain to learn about that its own reward so this kind of idea that you can get more efficient exploration by combining two chains instead of using them separately it's a really important part of, uh, of, of sort of what's structurally interesting about the, the solution we get here. So I think like mathematically what's interesting is this application of Poisson's equation to get to a really clean optimization problem whose solution is the optimal policy. Um, and structurally what's interesting is this kind of cooperative exploration idea that you can get much lower variance uh, by combining the use of chains to drive you into important regions of the state space uh, in ways that you couldn't do if you only have one chain or the other necessarily. Um, so I think that's an important and interesting insight. Could, Ramesh, could you characterize when you would have, I mean, because I guess in some sense, these two chains are in some sense opposite chains, right? I mean, yeah, very, yeah. Very loose way of putting it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good question. So to some extent, that's encoded in this, in this constraint here, VJ. Okay. Uh, because basically what's happening is if the P sort of factors in a way that regardless of whether you cha choose chain one or two, the states you get driven into look essentially the same, mm -hmm. then there's none of this cooperative exploration going on. Okay. But if using chain one, for example, drives you into certain states and using chain two drives you to other states, then this cooperative exploration could be a beneficial thing. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And I guess characterizing that in applications is interesting. So we've been looking at these kinds of problems in the context of queuing examples, uh, you know, where maybe what's happening is you're getting driven to different regions of the state space from, you know, based on service, uh, kind of where you have more or less service. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, I'm going to wrap up the talk with just a brief description of state space complexity. Um, I won't have time to go through all the all the uh, results here, but I just want to talk a little bit at a high level about what some of the things are that we did. Um, so I think there's two issues with the size of the state space and what we did. One of them is just computational efficiency, which is that obviously, you know, the computation of the optimal policy here scales with the size of the state space. And the other one is statistical efficiency, 
which is that this non-parametric MLE requires you to get enough samples at every state algorithm pair, okay? So you have both statistical and computational issues that arise the larger the state space gets. Um, so, you know, just in a, a brief description, we used regenerative policies to try to deal with the first one, and we use parametric uh, maximum likelihood to try to address the second one, and I'll just show you a slide on each one. So parametric maximum likelihood really is just what it sounds like, where what we do is we parameterize the Markov chains and rewards by some theta. And then essentially what's happening is that it allows the possibility of learning across states and across chains if the underlying parameter uh, is something which is commonly, you know, where you learn about the underlying parameter, even if you're in different states, okay? And so this can, you know, for, this is where queuing is a good example where the arrival rates and service rates might be the parameters. Uh, this gives you the possibility that you might have strong transfer learning and therefore have, uh, you know, potentially significant improvements in statistical efficiency. So this is work that I've been doing with Jose Blanchett, Peter Glynn, and Lin Jia Wu, our, our graduate student. Um, so that's one, one piece of it is parametric uh, um, maximum likelihood. The other thing from a computational efficiency standpoint, uh, one of the things we've done is we've thought about uh, what we call regenerative policies. So regenerative policies essentially involve saying <clears throat> that I only switch between chains at a given state, the regenerative state. And then what I do is I do all my estimation using sample averages on returns from that state back to itself. So suppose I'm at state XR, the regenerative state here, and I decide to run chain one. I come back to this state. Now I decide to run chain two. Maybe I decide to run chain two again. I've decided to run uh, chain one for the next uh, iteration. I run chain two, I run chain one, I run chain two, uh, sorry, run chain one again. Well, what we know from regeneration uh, from kind of renewal regenerative theory and Markov chains is that if I chain this block, this block, this block, this block, all back to back, this looks like one run of chain one. And this looks like one run of chain two. The fact that I ran chain two in between here has no bearing on sort of what's going to happen here when I run chain one from XR back to XR again at this point. All right, so I can take advantage of that to see that if I just estimate sample averages here and sample averages here to compute rewards, the sample average reward here converges to the steady state reward of chain one. The sample average reward here converges to the steady state reward of chain two. Okay, so that's like a that's an easy way that I could get uh, that that I can kind of use regeneration to help me in my estimation. You know, and then what we do is we work out that that's consistent and we, we kind of, you know, compute the optimal variance for uh, regenerative policies and, and construct like the optimal, uh, uh, the optimal uh, design for regenerative policies. That's a way to get something that's computationally a little bit simpler. Um, one important note, unfortunately, is that this can be unboundedly suboptimal uh, relative to the non-parametric maximum likelihood that I had talked about uh, previously. And roughly speaking, the intuition for that is that, you know, with that non-parametric maximum likelihood, we had the number of degrees of freedom is the number of states we have because we get to pick which policy we're going to use in every state. Uh, but we only have one degree of freedom here with uh, this, you know, because we only get to switch in the regenerative state. So you don't have as many degrees of freedom. Okay. Um, okay. So just to wrap up, um, uh, there's a... Um, uh, there's an upcoming seminar that I actually believe is going to be public in the in the MIT operations management um, series uh, on on um, two sided randomization, which is something I'll be I'll be uh, talking about there. Um, but there's also um, you know switchback and crossover designs are kind of this class of designs. Crossover is a work where um, uh, you would have the same type of idea, but with multiple parallel uh, chains that are running at the same time. So back to Bo's question from earlier, it'd be if I had many cities and I could think of each one of those as their own switchback. Um, another thing I could do is do what are called cluster randomized designs, which is the way, you know, what, what Bo said, uh, something I could take the city, I could divide it up into smaller clusters, randomize some to treatment and some to control, and then just let them run. And I can even combine these together to have a cluster crossover or cluster switchback design. Um, Two-sided randomization, this thing that I'll be talking about is something which allows us to construct uh, experiments where you randomize on both sides of a market and see, you know, use that to construct novel estimators and see kind of, you know, uh, uh, if we can minimize bias that way. So there's a lot of innovation across all of these techniques. There's lots of combinations. 
There's lots of innovation on the estimation side. So this is very fertile ground right now for modeling, uh, design, and estimation. Uh, you know, to try to deal with these uh, biases and, and uh, variance issues. Um, you know, one of the things I want to tell you is that if you're deciding, if you if you find this stuff interesting, you want to get into it. You know, here's some questions that I think are particularly interesting. I, I think one of the challenges for a practitioner is that they don't actually know what approach to use. In many ways, what any given platform does is an accident of history, whether they landed to do one thing or another thing. And, um, you know, so I think an important question is like, what should they use? Given what they choose to use, what's the bias they can expect? What's the variance? Um, you know, how should they estimate the variance? So how would they carry out inference if they wanted to build confidence intervals? And then ultimately, how do you optimize these designs and estimators to balance that bias and variance and provide practical guidance to platforms on which of, you know, these various approaches they should be using? So I really think this is like a, an important, um, broad space for people with our skill set uh, to be engaging with. Um, so let me stop there. Uh, still a couple minutes left for questions. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, oh, Bo has a question. So he says, uh, since I've talked about all these techniques can be used to do estimation, could I give a high level idea about the pros and cons? Sure, yeah. So um, I think it's actually pretty much along the lines of what I said earlier, Bo, that a lot of this comes down to where does the bias come from and where does the variance come from? So just to give you an idea of that, um, let's instead of thinking about something like Uber or Lyft or DoorDash, let's think about a platform that uh, has you know more of a, a natural kind of uh, um, well natural tendency to want to experiment by randomizing on one side of the market. So a good example of that would be e-commerce, where let's say you're Amazon and you want to test out whether a new way of recommending products to customers uh, is better or worse than the old way. So something pretty typical that Amazon might do is that they might randomize some customers to see the new recommendation system and some customers to see the old recommendation system. And then uh, the, you know, the problem is with that randomization, customers will be interacting with the same underlying inventory out of both groups and that creates interference. So if one uh, recommendation system tends to lead people to buy more, that's going to deplete supply as seen by the other recommendation system. And so the other recommendation system will look artificially worse than it really is. The first recommendation system will look artificially better than it really is. So that's a bias, right? But if you're randomizing among customers, since there's so many customers, it's a relatively low variance approach to experimentation and estimation. Another thing that Amazon could do is they could run a switchback where they run one recommendation system the whole time then they switch to the other recommendation, then they switch back to the first one, they switch back. Now the switch, is, the switch back has the benefit that it'll probably have lower bias, but it's probably going to have higher variance because it's as if the entire market is now your observational unit and there's very strong correlation structure between the individual uh, um, uh, choices that are being made. And so I think an important question for a platform is, well, how should it think about the bias and variance that arise in these different approaches, you know, which one should it pick? So intuitively, I think most people think that the correlations are far weaker in an e-commerce setting, which leads it to be beneficial to run an experiment where you're randomizing at the customer level. Whereas the correlations are much stronger in something like a ride sharing or delivery setting because of these mechanical interconnections across the spatial uh, region that make it so that it's more important to run something like a switchback design if you want unbiased estimation. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a sense of like how people think about those problems. I think I want to be clear though, there's not really very clear technical answers to a lot of these things right now. There's still a lot of, uh, it, it's a bit of an open issue. Yeah. So, uh, Ramesh, I had a couple of questions. One was, I mean, in some sense, there's an implicit assumption, at least in your analysis, that you know the system state accurately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good question. Perhaps in real yep. systems, you don't. Then how does how does one? Yeah, and that's a great question. Um, it's actually, you know, honestly, it's part. It's like a, I feel like it falls under the heading of of this complexity state space complexity question I raised. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, uh, this is something that we've been kind of actively working on, which is like an approach to thinking about how to deal with the fact that you don't even really know what the underlying state might be. Um, it's one reason I like the regenerative approach because there you don't need to know the whole state space. You only need to know a uh, kind of reference state, you know, so for, 
a platform like ride sharing, that might be the reference state might be something where your system is relatively empty, right? Where there's not a lot of rides coming in. So, or, or you know, thinking about it from the supply side that you have rel- adequate supply across all stations or something like that. Um, so, yeah, so I think that's a really, really good question. Uh, you know, how do you define states? And, and it's part of the reason I think the, the complexity issues around state-based definition, computational efficiency and statistical efficiency are like the main reasons I think this is more theory work and structural work, uh, foundational work, not really kind of a practical design to use. The other one is more based on the answer that you give, Bo, is uh, not for the e-commerce thing. Suppose you test out on something that is very high inventory, so it should not, I mean, wouldn't you, and a small number of customers, wouldn't that be, I mean, wouldn't that sort of remove a lot of the issues that you are saying? In a way? Yeah, actually, that's the, uh, that's the theorem in my paper with Gabriel, Hannah, and Inessa. Um, the one that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that I hadn't cited on the slide. Uh, the, the theorem in that paper is, um, is exactly to relate the bias of naive experimentation on one or the other side of the market to the supply demand imbalance. Okay. And so the one of the two that's the easier one to see is the one that you said, which is that if there's a lot more supply than demand, then randomizing on the demand side should be relatively unbiased. Um, the one that's a little less obvious to see because of the way inventory behaves is that randomizing on the supply side mm-hmm. is uh, also the better choice when the market is supply demand and balance the other way. And that becomes unbiased as well. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Okay. I have a question. Yeah, go for it. Um, so you mentioned something like that, but I, I want uh, some clarification. When assuming that you have um, all the primitives known in your analysis, Mm-hmm. You came up with two policies, these gamma policies, right? Um, yeah, so, so when all the primitives are known, we solve this optimization problem. Okay, so here's my question. So mm-hmm. did you mention that, that these policies can be thought of as optimal policies of, a, of uh, some MDP problem? And the question is, what is this MDP problem that these policies are optimal for? If you were to yeah. solve this MDP, yeah, that's a that's a great great question. So, what's happening here? One way to look at it, right, is that uh, let's let's first um, before we define the objective function of that MDP, hmm. let's just define the the control space, the policy space, right? So, what's happening is that at every time step, I get to choose an action, which is one of the two chains. Correct. That changes the state of the system, and also earns a re- some reward that I don't, I want to be careful with that term now because that reward is not the reward in this MDP. Yes. Okay. That's just, but it creates some observation. Let's call it an observation. Okay. And I transition to the next state. Again, I get a choice of one or two. Again, I get a new observation and so on. Okay. So that's the dynamical system. Now the problem is that it's a, it's sort of a, um, if you want to think of it this way, it's a messy average cost dynamic programming problem where my objective is to minimize the long run, uh, minimize my, my variance. So here, what we've done is minimize our scaled asymptotic variance. So essentially like this, there's this end of the one half here, right? So mm-hmm. if you want to look on finite horizons, it'll be as if your variance is like N times this quantity. Yes. Right. And so what we're doing is we're minimizing that, that scaled asymptotic variance. Uh, and, and so what you could do is you could say, well, suppose what I wanted to do is I have a constraint that whatever estimator I produce, right? So, so it's like, there's this other piece of my policy, which is that I actually have to spit out a statement of what my estimate is. And it's that statement of what my estimate is that incurs my cost. So I have a constraint on that, you know, statement of what my estimate is, that alpha N, my estimator, that has to be consistent, first of all. So that is that imposes an underlying constraint on the sequence of alpha ends that I produce. And then subject to the con- that constraint, I wanna minimize the, the total variance that I accumulate through my policy. Um, and, and so that's what this quantity is. Uh, N times this would be that, you know, uh, the asymptotic value of that quantity. So that's a, that's a crazy, you know, hmm. if, you want, if you want to think of it as MDP, that's a crazy MDP because there's no way to write down a Bellman principle for that problem that's that's at all tractable, except in the most abstracted sense, uh, right? And so, um, and so, yeah, that's that's kind of what we meant when we said that we're getting a nice structure, because in the end, this kappa star is giving us a policy, right? In that in that decision problem, it's telling us which 
probabilities, you know, these are the probabilities with which we play one or two in each state. So we're actually getting a stationary Markov policy as a solution to a really ugly dynamic optimization problem. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Hey, Rich, I, have a, I have a few questions. Sure, so, go for uh, it. Uh, the first thing is, uh, since you are estimating the uh, transition kernel, basically, right? So it seems like if we have a good estimation of the transition kernel, so given the state, then take particular action, what will be the next action or uh, distribution will be. So that doesn't have to be related to two particular policies. So basically, you can evaluate any two policies with the transition kernels unknown. Uh, so I was wondering all these results should hold for even you have like five and up to a number of policies, you can get this concentration result. Yeah, so I think, I think this, uh, right? I mean, in some sense, like, like this, I think, yes, this is a, you know, the, the technology that's creating, um, that's giving rise to this uh, uh, CLT result, right, is, is kind of a, a transformation through Poisson's equation to get a Markov chain CLT here. Mm -hmm. And yeah, if you had multiple policies, you could imagine getting a CLT for all of the policies. But one of the reasons that this is important for us, the way this is written here, is that um, we were interested in a difference between two policies. So one of the challenging questions, if you have multiple policies, is what's the right objective function? Um, like you know, so one thing you could try to do is try to estimate um, all differences simultaneously mm -hmm. to equal accuracy. But another thing you could try to do is just to say, I want to pick the best policy out of all of those, and that would look like a different problem because now you have a decision variable, which is just to say which policy is the one that has the best performance, right? Um, or you could want to do something like estimate the difference between the best policy and the second best policy. So that might be like another objective. So I think, you know, the, the weirdness about two here is just because uh, two, it's, it's sort of natural to write down this treatment effect as a difference between them. Um, you know, this also opens up lay, obviously, I didn't use the phrase at all in the talk, but it clearly opens up the possibility that we might be interested in multi-armed bandits, where... What I really want to do here is, um, you know, I get to I get to play a Markov chain. A Markov chain is an arm, mm -hmm. and I get estimation on that chain. And now I want to figure out, uh, you know, um, uh, what sort of what what's a good bandit policy to converge to the to one of a finite number of chains uh, as quickly as possible. And that's more closely related to some of the stuff in the bandits literature. You know, still a it's a structured bandit problem, right? Because it's not like a full RL problem, you only have like a finite number of chains you're choosing from. Instead of a typical RL problem, I'd say, well, I can choose, you know, a, a collection of actions in each state. And, and so that gives rise to a very large policy class. But here it's like we have a finite policy class. Right, right. So maybe the problem would be, let's say if I have a policy class, if I do want to uh, somehow understand the difference of arbitrary two policies in that set, I mm -hmm. uh, can design our uh, exploration policy, maybe it has nothing to do with this uh, right, policy right. Right, in my set, right? Uh, as long as I understand the transition kernels well enough, uh, then I can evaluate the difference of the policies. Yeah, and in some sense, that's kind of a little bit what's going on here. This Kappa star, it is actually kind of an exploration policy, right? Because it's mm -hmm. like, if it's doing that cooperative exploration, it's basically like that. It's kind of taking advantage of what I have available to me to learn as as efficiently as I can, so, right, yeah. right, right, yeah, right. yeah. So it's, it's definitely like these. That's why I in the very beginning I said there's sub connection to reinforcement learning because definitely these concepts from RL show up a little bit in the structure of the solution and so on. Yeah, right. So so I think the uh, in your exploration policy it turns into the you switch between uh, policy one and policy two, mm -hmm. uh, but I think you also have the uh, randomizer part, right? The uh, um, yeah, so like this is this is randomized, yeah. This is randomized yeah, this between, one. yeah. So it seems there's also maybe a possibility to add exploration in the randomization as well, instead yeah, of so that's, greedy. Yeah, so I think that's. Uh, do you mean? Oh, sorry, you're thinking about this one. You mean the online? Because we're estimating the transition kernel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like it. how yeah. often, how accurate the transition kernel is? Maybe we can add a bonus there to improve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And 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 right. So I, I think I said this is super sloppy because one could use many different forms of forced exploration and still get a valid CLT at the end. Mm -hmm. So what would you do to choose among them? And the obvious thing is you'd have some finite horizon regret type characterization where you say, well, 
like if I actually care about how quickly I'm getting to that efficient variance, that will depend on how I force my exploration, right? Right, right. right. And, and so, yeah, I could be smarter about that, adaptive about that, and I could do better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. 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 Another question I think relate to Vijay's question, I think you already comment on that. I was wondering, or uh, is there any way to do like kind of is a sloppy use of the terminology model free way to solve this problem instead mm -hmm. of estimating the transition kernel because in that case the state space is really, really large uh if i just interesting two particular policies is there any way to avoid of uh, estimating these transition kernel but still able to tell the difference between two policies yeah i think that's a really really good question um I want to remind I want to remind that like my emphasis here was on design and to some extent on estimation, although I kind of cheated my way out of the estimation problem by committing to doing non-parametric maximum likelihood. So let's actually back up a little bit and imagine that design and estimation were both on the table and you could do what you wanted to do, right? Mm -hmm. So the way I would look at it is it is that if you're going to go model free, the model free piece would be on the estimation side. Yeah. Yeah. And you would basically say that there's some black box way that you're going to take the data you got to compute an estimate of the reward. Mm -hmm. And the first thing you would want to know is that the black box estimation piece, that's going to impose some constraints on what policies will still give rise to consistent estimation. Mm -hmm. So that would be the starting point is like, I, I, so I guess I'm, I'm, I'm not helping answer your question. I'm just translating it into the, into the framework is that the, once I go model free, it's like, I'm saying, I'm going to do my estimation in a different way. And then the, the technical question becomes which types of experimental designs lead to consistency of your estimate with that model free approach. Or maybe you say you're willing to accept some bias and that could be fine too, in which case you'll have a bias variance trade-off or something that you want to optimize for. And so then you can ask yourself, well, which designs give me a good bias variance trade-off with that model free approach? So a simple example of a model free approach, by the way, one way to look at a model free approach is that in that, in that example I gave of a two-sided market, I could randomize on you know, one side of the market and I know I'll have some bias in that randomization if I use just naive estimation. And so one of the things I could do is I could say, well, you know, I will actually try to build a model-free view of what I think, let's say the booking rate of guests in Airbnb would have been if in fact this treatment had been applied to the whole market, mm -hmm. okay? So this is like a, this, this can be done as kind of a, uh, you know, machine learning uh, extrapolation of the data you got in the experiment into what would have happened if people were actually subjected to this treatment market wide, maybe by trying to, you know, do kind of a, 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 a machine learned model for how people make their choices from choice sets and then, and then, you know, building from there. And so you could do that. And now you'd have a different estimator. And then you can ask, well, what's the bias and the variance for that estimator for this kind of naive design that we built, right? So, so I think that I think there's definitely a lot to do there, actually, and and it is very practical um, to think about it from a model-free perspective. You know, I I think one of the things I'm trying to clarify in my answer is that I don't think the model freeness lets you get away from state-space issues because you're still going mm -hmm. to have to think a little bit about the so the design is telling you when you're allowed to change between the two policies. Mm -hmm. I see. And that, okay. There's still that element of it that's present, you know, and then the mm -hmm. estimation is the thing that says, well, what do you do with the information you collected? So fine, you could ditch the state space completely if you wanted to when you do your estimation, but somehow that'll be entangled up with the structure of your design and the design still has to tell you when you're running one policy versus another. So in some sense, there's some implicit state space that your design will have to work with, which says, when is it, what based on history, what are you using from the history to decide to run policy one versus policy two? Uh, Ramesh, so if we are able to solve the estimation problem, let's say I have an Oracle, which can give me accurate estimate, mm -hmm. uh, then isn't the design the policy when to switch for that problem, we can view that as a, for example, a Q-learning problem. So I have two actions. I just need to pick two of the actions. I think the difficulty may be what is the right reward function as you pointed out, right? This is a very complex <laughs> yeah, reward yeah. function. Right? Yeah, I think, I think that's right. I mean, yeah, I, mean, I, I don't actually know if that's true that like if you get an Oracle that tells you what the right estimate would have been, mm -hmm. I'm not sure that's totally enough to get you to the point where you have the right Q, Q learning setup because you still need the reward function for that Q learning setup. And, and the key thing here is that you're actually, 
it's like you don't care about the thing I called reward. The the real reward was this variance, and and that right, doesn't right, right. have. Go back. That doesn't have. Like maybe if your oracle is willing to give you the variance, yeah, then then of course you could do it. But but that's the that's like that's that's uh that's where the challenge is coming from. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Very interesting talk. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, those are great questions. Um, thanks everybody. It was uh, fun catching up. I think I'll see some of you tomorrow. Uh, yeah. Just, uh, in, in just, a couple just of check if there are any other questions. Just wanted to take a quick poll. Uh, there aren't any. So let's thank Ramesh. Sorry. Hey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thanks everybody. Um, talk to you tomorrow. I think Vijay, I'll see you tomorrow as well, right? Yes. Yeah. Tomorrow afternoon. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Bye-bye everyone. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks again. Bye. Bye.